and had been heavily involved in the ongoing dispute between the patricians and the plebeians, the common folk who were constantly clamoring for more power in the republic. So he was very much a traditionalist, very much a conservative, very much in favor of patrician rule, but ultimately his loyalty was to Rome itself. And so even though his political fortunes had taken a great downturn, even though he was almost penniless and surviving by the sweat of his brow on his own farm across the Tiber River from the city of Rome, when a delegation of senators came to him and said, Cincinnatus, the barbarians are at the gate. We need you to help us. He immediately dropped his plow. He immediately crossed the river with them. He immediately put on his toga and gave a speech and said, tonight, all able-bodied men will meet at the field of Mars, the god of war. And they did. And with that quickly assembled army, he marched out of the gates of Rome and destroyed the barbarians. When the war was over and won, the senators looked for Cincinnati to give him his honors, perhaps to give him a triumph, a parade through the city. They couldn't find him. Where has he gone, they said. Well, they found out soon enough he had gone back to his farm. He was already back behind the plow. A total of 16 days had elapsed. He had been appointed dictator of Rome. All powers. He still had most of the six months left on his term. And as we know, that term was very much negotiable. When you make somebody a dictator, it's always an open question whether he or she, he in this case, would step down at the end of that six months. But he had stepped down after 16 days. He had not stayed on one day longer than was necessary. The comparison is fairly obvious. This resulted, of course, in the foundation later of the founding of the Society of the Cincinnati, um, after which the city of Cincinnati and a number of other towns and cities in the United States were, were named. And that's the standard narrative that you hear of George Washington, and it is an appropriate one. How many of you have heard of Sulla? I don't see a single hand in the room. Let's talk about Sulla for just a moment, because Sulla is the third man I'm going to talk about today, the second of the two Romans. Sulla followed Cincinnati by several hundred years. By this time, the Roman Republic was in its late stages. The Roman Empire was getting close to its height. Most of the empire was actually acquired during the Republic, interestingly enough. And once again, you had a Roman patrician, Sulla, who was very much on the patrician side of the ongoing struggle between the plebeians and the patricians. Sulla's fortunes, too, were difficult. He was born, despite his patrician birth, into poverty. He rose through his military genius, through his political skills, to positions of great power and became one of the rising stars among the Roman generals. He, too, was called upon to fight many important battles. But here's where the differences start. When Sulla was out campaigning, he heard news that the plebeians had taken control of Rome. They were instituting what Sulla considered to be radical reform, doing things that Sulla considered corrupt, violating what Sulla considered to be the Roman Constitution, the way of the elders, an unwritten constitution that was essentially a series of precedents, a series of, of practices that had endured throughout the centuries. He was challenging the established order. I should say the plebeians were challenging the, the, stand, the established order, and Sulla felt that Rome itself was in danger. So he did something that had never been done before. He marched on Rome itself. He took a Roman army and breached the walls of Rome itself. Established himself as a dictator. And with what, with what appeared to be Pure motives, from his perspective, forced through a series of constitutional reforms. 
designed to reverse the power of the plebeians and reestablish the way of the elders. Patrician power. He then resigned his dictatorship and went off to campaign some more. The plebeians came back a second time. They took control again. And so a second time he came back. And this time he really spent some time reforming things. Killing people, thousands of people who he felt were corrupt. And abolishing institutions that he felt were inconsistent with the Roman Constitution. After which he resigned again. So, great guy, right? I mean, he was doing it for the right reasons. He was doing it because he felt it was his duty. He was rescuing his city from what he thought were the excesses of the common people. He took power only long enough to fix things. He's just another Cincinnatus, right? But did you notice the distinction? Cincinnatus was given these powers by representatives of the Roman people and kept them only as long as was necessary to defend the Republic from enemies. Exterior enemies. Barbarians, as they called them. Sulla took that power himself. And he used it to establish what he felt was the best constitutional order in Rome. He abolished many things. Many of them were bad things. There was a lot of corruption at that time. But as the historians tell us, the one thing that Sulla could not abolish was his own example. And so it was no surprise a generation later when Pompey, one of the great rivals of Julius Caesar, himself very ambitious, said, well, if Sulla could do it, then why can't I? Caesar himself followed Sulla's example as he seized power in Rome. And his only criticism of Sulla was that Sulla had been foolish to give up his dictatorial powers. Caesar was killed, but as we know, he was followed very shortly thereafter by Octavian, who then became Augustus, the first Roman emperor, and the Republic was finished. So Washington was not merely emulating Cincinnatus. He was avoiding the example of Sulla. If Washington, confronted with the dysfunctional, bankrupt government of the United States, confronted with recalcitrant, uncooperative, squabbling states, had said, someone needs to come in and clean house. Someone needs to abolish all of this corruption, and I am that man. It is my duty, and I shall do so. He may have done so out of the best of motives. He may have done some temporary good, but like Sulla, the one thing he would not have been able to abolish was his own example. Knowing this, Washington gave up power, not once, not just at Annapolis, and after the Revolutionary War in 1783, but years later, after his second term as president in 1797. And so it was no mistake when King George III, hearing about these things, hearing about especially Washington's giving up power at the end of his second term as president, turned to a man who was painting the king's portrait. His name was Benjamin West. He happened to be an American. King George III turned to this painter, Benjamin West, and said, well, what would Washington do after winning independence? West replied, they say he will return to his farm. If he does that, the incredulous monarch said, he will be the greatest man in the world. That's 
quite a title. But I think if any American deserves it, it may very well be Washington. And so as you go out as young lawyers, and you are frustrated, and you are angered, and as you see corruption, and as you feel it is your duty to do good things for society, always remember the example of George Washington. Always remember your constitutional values. Always work for the good, but always within the law. Follow Washington's and Cincinnati's examples, and not Sullivan's. That concludes our Constitution Day celebration for 2012. So those of you who are visiting, please feel free to enjoy some more coffee or some more Madeira wine out in the lobby. The rest of you, you're stuck with me until class is over. But we'll take a moment or two before we resume our class. Thank you.